honor and a privilege to be uh, asked to moderate this uh, lively and spirited panel on, on manliness and Thumos and Harvey's work. And I guess since people have been talking about their student days, I'll just say that uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether perhaps a, a subtitle could be the gender neutral executive. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, um, the, the most one of the most striking incidents I remember from our Machiavelli class was your presentation of Catherine Swartz, Swartz and her, um, her her genderless excellence as a as, as a as a as a ruler. So um, uh, her preference for uh, career over family. Well, <laughs> yes, as as every executive must. Um, um, so we're, as you, you say in the, in, the, in the chapter we were asked to read, um, you say we must confront manliness, which is a, a very manly way to address manliness. And so on that, on that note, I would open the floor since we have you know, not, not so much time till five. I expect there'll be many comments, so please feel free. Yeah. Yes. May we also address the piece on Thumos? So yes. Uh, well, in the that piece, you say that when we do not receive some material thing that we're after, it's not so much the thing that we're angry about. It's being denied our, our claim. Does that mean that we're not quite so materialistic as Coquel might accuse us of being? Is that uh, actually, Tocqueville doesn't say that we're materialistic in the sense of uh, well, well, desiring one thing after another. Uh, uh, what he worries about is honest materialism rather than greedy materialism, uh, uh, even decent materialism. Uh, he realizes that most people are satisfied with uh, a decent competence, and that, uh, but and that they uh, take great satisfaction in and will uh, defend and uh, in, insist on, and uh, and in, in, in general say uh, a, a labor a labor union will be much readier readier to defend what it has or what it has received from the past. And to gain what is new, and 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 people are like that in, in in general. So uh, this he says results uh, in uh, not so much in corrupt souls as in um, soft ones. Yes. Uh, I thought reading the manliness book that you're right, the necessary audience is because uh, even though Machiavelli says there's these two humors, some, there's some there are makers, there are takers, sanitize it. Actually, it's a choice whether to try to distinguish yourself. Or, and, uh, and then want many things, confidence or money or security or reputation, but they also want women. They almost always want women. Or a woman. And, uh, <clears throat> Sometimes one is enough. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes one is too many. Yeah. Men don't want their exist. Women 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 don't want their is there going to be men who make the choice to be man and I saw him here at the last year. I said that on page one. Man. <laughs> 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 Uh, the, the, uh, those, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, educated women. Later on, I say those who want to know. Yes. I 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. Tocqueville has five chapters on women in the third part of the second volume of Democracy in America. That's what he's referring to. You're, you're appealing to responsible women to take responsibility, including for manhood, for cultivating it and giving some place to it. Yeah. Is, is, is this, is this a, a modern, ancient distinction? Do the, do the ancients put so much weight, put responsibility on women in bringing out manliness, if manliness is the same for, for, the, for the ancients and the moderns? I'm not sure those ancient women had that much choice. <laughs> but they managed to provide for manliness without it, apparently. Hmm. Is that, is that true? Um, I don't know. Uh, you tell me. <laughs> or is it that men did what they could and women suffered what they had to? Yeah. Uh, the, that's the way of the world. You're right. Um, and, um, but uh, somehow it happened that when uh, women got fed up with the way of the world, they were able to change it in our time. So this is uh, an amazing uh, transformation of, uh, or is it? A transformation of uh, of sex roles and and expectations of men and women. Yes. Hi, I'm Rory Schachter, I'm a graduate student here. I, I also don't have my long range classes. Mm -hmm. on, so. <laughs> I wanted to ask um, in. The manliness book, I mean... Uh, just make a comment. You don't have to ask something. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I tried... In the, man, the manliness book's written more about my generation, and I, I kind of compared it to Alan Bloom's book, The Closing American Mind, which is written about students who are, I don't know, about 20, 30 years older than me. And I guess uh, to try and judge the, the accuracy of the portrait, and it's difficult to capture the spirit of the youth. Um, even if you're among them or if you're not. I mean, it seems like to me in trying to look at the gender-neutral society that the virtue that Bloom saw in the young, or not the virtue, but the characteristic was niceness. And I, I, it's hard for me, and I just open this up, it's hard for me to say whether niceness is, is, uh, is something which, um, which helps the gender-neutral society along or which uh, is itself neutral and could be used um, both to advance it or, or not. Um, and, I, and a lot of the similarities in the behavior of men and women today, my generation, undergraduates slightly younger than me here, it seems to me is guided. The, the similarity amongst the men and the women is and most of all similarity, and they're both being nice in the same way. And so, you know, and I just, and I, I see much less of the so-called, it seems that feminism is not as militant or that feminism is not an ism that's, ever, that's usually spoken of, perhaps because it got its way, but perhaps because niceness doesn't go very well with feminism because feminists had to be kind of pushy to, to get their way, at least in the early stages. So I, you know, I, I, I find it a little bit difficult to track the, how neutral the gender neutral society amongst the young is because of this. What is niceness? Does that mean not aggressive? Yes, and not, it's, it seems that it's a little bit like the British tendency not to not in certain social settings to take your own views too seriously or insist upon them, but without a corresponding view that in private or in another situation one might might stand much more severely on principle. It seems like it's a it's an easygoingness, um, but um, the the men it seems to me can be nice because they they won't be faulted for that because it doesn't they don't seem soft because of it. So it seems like niceness. So again, I, I I throw it out because I don't really understand the relationship very well. But it, whether what's dominating here, whether the young are really caught up with the gender neutral society in the same way today as they were even twenty years ago. Yes.
Catherine, yes. I'm smiling very nicely. Go ahead, then, then, then. Okay, okay. I want to shift to two moths still, so maybe you want to pursue uh, No, I was going to raise this. So I want to ask about the uh, two moths essay, which I think I'm Peter Hall. I'm uh, one of the parties called it. And I, um, I think it's a wonderful critique of political science, unfortunately. Uh, but I, I want to ask you about the body soul problem in the two moths, because the essay begins. Uh, talks a lot about the body and Tumas, I, as I understand your account of it and as I, in a more limited way, understand um, uh, Aristotle's account of it, uh, this is something, this is a care for the soul that is in some sense rooted in the body. And, um, so it, it invokes uh, those issues and, and your essay, uh, on my reading, starts out by emphasizing the body, and, and Tumas produces anger, the kind of anger uh, that, that uh, one sees in a dog when it bristles a uh, rat. Um, but um, and Tumas is ultimately uh, an expression of her care for the soul, as I understand it, and, uh, and, and uh, the overriding theme is that it represents, that, that it uh, reflects an insistence on our own importance. And then, of course, our own importance is, is largely speaking relative to other people, right? So it, it, uh, as you point out, it also reflects a concern for reputation. And uh, I, I was left uh, feeling uncertain about the extent to which we could see Tumas as anything like a beneficent force in the world. I mean, the, um, I think you rightly emphasize uh, the role of anger in politics, uh, concerns about uh, respect, etc. I, I think that's an important corrective to the political science that you're criticizing. But I wonder if we, in the course of doing that, you don't um, um, uh, you don't develop as much as you might uh, the, the ways in which uh, Tumas um, makes positive contributions to a more positive politics, and, and not only by a uh, it's the way it inspires ambition or a search for greatness, but but more generally, even for ordinary people. I wondered if you'd say something about that. Um, sure. Um, I, I think Thumas is, is or anger is uh, both both good and bad, and what what is good about it is that uh, it, it's not satisfied with the status quo, it's not, so it um, um, ra raises an issue. But anger. Uh, has a characteristic of raising the stakes, uh, and that and that's because uh, w with anger goes your reason, and uh, you're you're angry because you because of something, because of some reason. And when you give that reason, then you uh, don't just treat yourself as by yourself, but as a case of a category. So uh, I'm uh, the way the that uh, Achilles said um, it, it, w it wasn't just that uh, Agamemnon they all stole his girlfriend and that makes him angry. No, no uh, Agamemnon is a certain type of human being, a, 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 a stuck-up, pompous character who, who in inherited all his uh, privileges, whereas I am a he-man and I uh, d you know, defend them with my sword and, and it's people like me who should be ruling and not like, not like him. So uh, the, the, the Thumas always has this uh, uh, potentially political, meaning revolutionary, really, uh, um, aspect to it. It, it, uh, it, it wants to change things uh, 
ca categorically. And so, so that makes it go with justice because it, it, it isn't, uh, although it may have been your own case that uh, got it started, still uh, you generalize. And, and in generalizing, you, uh, you make it uh, uh, something of justice. So this seems to me the way that uh, politics gets started. And th this is a better explanation than that uh, there's a limited number of good things and we each of us want as much as we can get of those good things. So is, is it fair then to say that if you ignore or suppress thumos, that is, or in, in the feminist tendency, if you object to it, that you undermine that elevation? Yes. Yeah. The, who were the feminists but angry women? So they had their reason. And they, they had said for a millennia now, women have been uh, stomped on and looked down upon, uh, put upon. And uh, we're going to, uh, we have the ambition to put an end to that. And, so, so that. and their desire for equality was really a desire for equality of, uh, of honor. And it couldn't have been satisfied with, uh, here, dear, his extra 20 bucks for you. So how do you claim, I mean, it, it, the trick then, it seems to me, is for women to demand respect without exhibiting any, right? without trying to take away due respect from the manly assertion of um, superiority? The, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> without taking away from the, uh, the fact that this uh, feeling prevails more among men than among women. So um, the mistake of, uh, of feminism is to uh, identify human happiness with male happiness. And so feminism was always not really an attack on men. It was, uh, what was the, you know, the title of, uh, of Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique. It was an attack on femininity. And it was fe femininity that had been put upon men, put upon women by, uh, by men seeking to take advantage of them. And uh, so, so that was, uh, it was, uh, you know, Betty Friedan was really going after her fellow women. That they suffer from this, uh, um, what a disease with no name, <laughs> which is really uh, ennui has a name, uh, <laughs> and uh, it was the same that you know you got throughout the 19th century, and that was um, so. Um, yes, uh, there, there's uh, there's there's a satisfaction in being a woman too, without having to do uh, exactly the same thing as a man. Now that doesn't mean that. Uh, that women don't uh, seek certain kind of manly satisfactions, for example, recognition, honor. Or they, they like, like a job and with a, a door with your name on it. That's, uh, <laughs> you know, what a professional uh, uh, wants and uh, what uh, a lot of women are, are seeking. But it's a different kind, if you look at it, it's a different kind of ambition. It's more of what might call, one might call a niche ambition to, they, women have their, a picture in their mind of what they want, much more, I think, definite than what uh, men do. And so this, it isn't necessarily this desire to be numero uno, mm -hmm. as, as men have. How but, do you uh, know? <laughs> <laughs> because of my uh, ob observation yeah. and um, my uh, manly boldness. <laughs> <laughs> I used to feel that way, too, before we were philosophers. <laughs> Well, I just uh, maybe I could just interject something here. I mean, since you allow that there are different kinds of men, um, do you think that women vary as much, or do you think women are are more true to type, as it were? Because if they're if, yeah, if women, a, women are more uh, uh, flexible, more more. Uh, but are they uniformly more flexible, or are some women <laughs> more flexible than other women? Of course, some are more than others, <laughs> same as men, but. but uh, so, no, yes. I just wonder what, what I, I, yeah. would, I mean, will you indulge a generalization? That's what I've been doing, yes. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, yeah well, 
women are um, more observant, less oblivious than men, and so they're able to uh, to make adjustments, or they have they they can see that they ought to make adjustments, which um, men are totally incapable of of doing, you know, at least on their own, and often even with the good advice of their wives. So, yeah. Yes. Picking up on Susan Michelle's remark, how would you know? Um, uh, if you had to identify, speaking from your perspective as, as a manly man, if you had to identify <laughs> one major mistake made by the American woman's movement, what would it be? Hmm. Well, uh, feminism. <laughs> One major mistake. One major mistake. <laughs> Could easily have had all the good things of life uh, but without. Uh, Adopting the view that uh, there are no essences, that um, woman is an historical creature instead of a natural one, on various uh, um, very misleading untruths um, of of that kind, and um, which um, and the, all right, the big, biggest mistake they made was falling for the sexual revolution. <laughs> that is, that is not in the interest of women. It's in the interest of women to uh, be to consider that they are more modest than men, and for good reason, and that um, they need to defend defend this with some version of the uh, double standard, and and so, uh, and especially to have violated the double, to insist on a single standard at the level of men, <laughs> in, instead of insisting that we, uh, men behave like women, they let themselves. Uh, 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 t t take the license to behave like the most predatory uh, males. So I would say yes, that was their biggest sort of practical mistake. I mean, it came out of this uh, theoretical error, or combined with a theoretical error of uh, b believing in the things that Simone de Beauvoir says. Yes. Hi, Andy Sobel. I don't want to try to shift gears a bit. So, um, so later in the end, you spoke about going into it quickly. You talk about, you mentioned professionalism as a desire to have a, a name on your door. But, um, but you talk about it more pejoratively in a different way in the end of book that uh, there's a, a false professionalism that comes in never getting anything and never picking a fight um, because we're always, I, I, I'm self we're always looking forward. we are always saying, well, how can we come to an agreement? How can we mutually profit? And, that, and if you get angry, except briefly and strategically, you can't do that. Um, in the sort of political ethics business where I sometimes find myself, it's often to the core that politics is not a proper profession, um, which is a, a strange complaint in many ways. There's not going to be a licensing exam and so forth, you know, and the um, American Politics Association, like the Bar Association, that licenses. But all, is, is it more fundamentally the case that it could never be a profession because it's all about, about getting angry and about, in particular, acknowledging the fact that this is a, that there's winners and losers, that two people cannot win the same election, um, and, and, and so forth. Is there a fundamental assumption there? And should the rest of our professions be more like politics? Should it be you know, more of an open acknowledgement that, they're, that not everyone's going to be the, you know, the leading doctors in New York, as you see in I haven't worked this all out, but um, you know how we should change everything to bring back manliness. I, uh, but I, I perhaps wouldn't start that way. <laughs> um, you know, um, the, um, uh, the professional politicians are the political consultants, and uh, as such, un they are very professional and therefore never get angry. And they ought to be able to s shift from one side to another easily, and sometimes they do, but usually. Um, Usually they stick with one side, but maybe that's only because their uh, their knowledge is more of their party's position than the others. Although, 
you would think that you would need to know both in order to counter both. So there's a, there is a certain uh, humanity, you say, left in their um, crass partisanship. But uh, otherwise, uh, you're right that, that, uh, that it's, it's not a uh, professional, uh, politics is not a profession, and, and, it, and it shouldn't be. The whole idea of professionalism is, uh, is gender neutral, and so that's one of the things, uh, when not, apart from feminism, which has um, made manliness less, uh, less pronounced, less acute, um, in our time. So I, in my book, I cite the, the movie Fargo of this pregnant woman who, uh, uh, you know, th throughout the movie, uh, uh, faces a series of uh, either weak or criminal males, all of whom she handles with great aplomb, uh, merely following the proper rules of uh, police behavior as uh, laid set forth in uh, James Q. Wilson's Varieties of Police Behavior. <laughs> which, a book which, which can never be too often recommended. Let, let me uh, make a little attempt. Uh, it's a real stretch for my soul, but to, to understand uh, feminism sympathetically from a certain direction. Uh, starting with your almost last <coughs> statement uh, in this uh, chapter, the problem is that men need to feel important Exactly. Well, of course, you wouldn't deny that women need to feel important. Maybe the point is that men, men's feeling important is more problematic, a little less natural, needs a little bit more conventional support or something. But uh, since it's clear that women, at some level, need to feel important too, I trust, then maybe the question is, why didn't, uh, I don't know, we can leave Simone de Beauvoir out of it, but why, why didn't Betty Friedan feel important? Or let's leave her out of it. Why didn't the, why didn't the women who responded to what Betty Friedan was saying feel important? It seems like something must have been, uh, some, uh, some ground of importance must have been uh, evacuated. Uh, there must have been some problem there that feminism was responding to, even if not in the smartest way, or that took real account of the nature of the sexes. And even going back to Tocqueville, those wonderful chapters of his on the uh, manly, uh, that culminate in the manly virtue, <laughs> in the sense in which the responsibility of women in America is uh, an example of uh, manliness. Uh, it, uh, I resonate with those chapters and their uh, attempt to, Tocqueville's attempt to, uh, to hold to a equality and difference between men and women. But if you look closely, it's, it's kind of unequal in the sense that the, the, the burden that women are asked to bear is, uh, is, is heavy and the compensations I mean, it's really kind of an appeal to uh, to stern duty without much to back it up or to beautify it. Uh, so uh, it seems to me to come back to making men and women, how do we now make men and women feel important? Uh, we've swung from one extreme to another maybe and lost sight of uh, a reasonable frame of the question how men and women can both be important. Talk feels um, men are unerotic, uninteresting to women. Mm -hmm. oh, they're all businessmen make, business making money, material enjoyments. Yeah. No, so there's no eros in their, in their lives, these women. That's what they need. Ah. But the way it manifests itself in women is a kind of bitterness. 
And why is that? Well, it's, it's because when they're weaker, they're vulnerable, they, they're not able to assert their females, they're not able to, to affect what, um, what they want. Um, so it, it, it emerges as a kind of bitterness and frustration. Well, okay, so flash forward to contemporary times, and the external situation for women is much, much more similar. So, you know, everything from the a police force that protects us to personal trainers who make us tough and strong and can even make them into a, a, a combat soldier. Um, it, the, the, the external opportunities, or the, the, the way in which the most, um, the way in which things work so as to allow us to manifest our females, the way in which our females manifest, maybe has changed. And so maybe it really is. This is kind of a historical question. Maybe it really is that women do need to feel as important as men do. So men fight wars a lot less, men are um, less, you know, no duels anymore. They're less propelled into situations that it's kind of, you know, females face. Uh, that, that traditional um, has, has that traditional manifestation, and for women, you know, the situation is more equalized. So now they're the most manifest itself more as wanting the same kind of dignity. I think this is the most elaborating on what you said. They want the same kind of dignity. They want the same kind of force as men. Um, again, as a simple point would be: has, has, has or the question has, has the External situation change such that now it almost manifests itself much more similarly in men and women than it ever did. And as a result, it is really possible to have this kind of difference. Um, well, uh, I seem to be answering more to, um, in this session. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, that's so. But it's still the case uh, that uh, women want family as well as career. Family is uh, is is a really a, quite an opposite uh, uh, consideration, and and as and as long as the sexes are unequal in their you know, desire for uh, children and mothering, um, I I think uh, a, a difference is going to remain. Uh, to be successful in a career, you have to be single-minded. You have to be able to put things aside and then never be distracted. And uh, keep your eye on the ball. Uh, be single-minded the way a man is. Whereas uh, to be uh, a mother, uh, well, those kids uh, think they're entitled to 100% of your time. And they, and they, uh, so <laughs> yeah, you can, you can. <laughs> You can do that. Yeah. Ready to jump right in and fill that need. They can, yeah. But it's still remarkable that they don't. They still have that natural impulse and urge through ten thousands of years of evolutionary biology, but this is a modern phenomenon of twenty, you know, thirty, forty years of being there. In the interest of upbringing. Um, Jim and, and Bob Faulkner. Yeah, I'm wondering about the question of uh, feeling important and whether the failing that Betty Friedan notices is somehow that the men uh, are not making their ladies feel important, right? And one suggestion, let me you just have two great suggestions. One would be the problem is the abolition dueling, right? Because <laughs> you dueled over women, right? And so if now no man will really fight. <laughs> For you, you're not going to feel important. And then the other would have to do with the reasons men would want families and children, right? Because if childbearing isn't uh, praised and continuing the family line and having the son, uh, and, and then the surprise of finding out that having the daughter is just as much fun and maybe greater. I, I was taken aside when my wife was pregnant with our first child by a fellow, a manly sort of guy at our church who explained. All men say they want the sons, but daughter, she would think you're the best. <laughs> and so it was good advice, actually. So, so I had daughters first. So, uh, but, but see, that would, if somehow our change in the way men live, if we're just functionaries or something like that, organization men or something, somehow 
makes less that concern that Tocqueville presents as an aristocratic concern, where the, the son is the father continued, uh, and, and the father's immortality is in the son. If that's the case, it really matters who the mother is. And that it be a mother who actually is not happy to have anybody raise the child, but is going to take responsibility for, for forming that child in a certain way. And some of her thumos goes into uh, no one else, you know, feeding the child wrong or letting the child watch the wrong things or, or educating the child wrong. But it's the, the mother who takes control of the rest of the child. On that view, marriage is a partnership in something profoundly important and, uh, that stirs the strongest ambitions. Cliff. Um, I've always been struck by the significance of something much less for that, namely the educational revolution. Because when I was at Cornell in the mid 60s, the sexual revolution, which was pre feminist, and the educational revolution, which in a way was also, were both underway simultaneously. And the striking thing about the educational revolution, which is very prosaic, is that at Cornell, where the women had previously been confined to the College of Home Economics, <laughs> they were now in the College of Arts and Sciences. And because Cornell was one of the few Ivy League colleges to admit women, the fact that the quality of women at Cornell was exceptionally high. But what this meant is that the men themselves were saying to the women, look, our way of life is better, our education is the one that matters. Um, so equality requires you know, that. We, we, we admit you to this way of education, which is preparing you to be professionals, and it then shut the door on them, right? They're, they're going to be getting exactly the same education as them. Their opportunities were not the same as them. So to the expectations, you know, were added the frustration, which, you know, understandably, um, fueled anger. Um, so it's not a very dramatic story, but I think that, you know, the importance of that hasn't been, hasn't been sufficiently appreciated. But, strange but you wouldn't say that's what's going on now, right? What's going on? That, uh, I mean, maybe I misunderstood you, but, but it seems to me now women are that the majority of college students and the door is not shut. Women are, I mean, I guess there are some statistics that say that women still earn less than men, but I, I and I haven't examined them, but it seems to me plausible, as Harvey says, that it's primarily because there are women working part time and you know choosing to have more moderate ambitions in their careers because of childbearing. And I mean, so I, it seems to me that shutting the door part isn't happening. Oh no, I agree entirely. I agree entirely. It, what, Bob, then, and then. My question goes to the nature of the Harvey's discussion of Thumos rather than the, rather than the feminist question. So, uh, if you want to continue that, I'll. Uh, go ahead. We don't have much time anyway. Yeah, go ahead. We only have five more minutes, yeah. so please. Uh, I think your emphasis in the, gener in the Jefferson lecture on Thumos is, is really wonderful, especially in the face of uh, too much niceness. Uh, and, and also your wonderful attempt to revive politically partisanship and, and respect for partisanship. These things go together with free government. Um, but I, I'm wondering about the deeper account of Thumos. I was very interested in Professor Hall's remarks, uh, in, which, uh, in which you, you tend to say that, that anger is really the beginning of a concern for, I, I'm going to perhaps put words in your mouth, for justice. That is to say, uh, we're sort of individuals concerned with our own importance, and when we run into something that baffles us, that is a barrier, uh, uh, there's anger. And therefore, it's a really important uh, political thing. Um, I just wonder whether that doesn't uh, make First of all, justice into a kind of constructed or construction, mm. uh, and and whether that doesn't underestimate uh, the way we grow up, so to speak, with opinions, and whether they be patriotic or whether they be of decency, if we're well brought up, if we're well brought up, uh, and that raises another uh, a question which uh, Nasser Benegar uh, 
uh, attempted in another way. <coughs> Give you an account of starting with an individual and then uh, raising a kind of uh, uh, a, bit, a, a kind of a constraints on oneself. Is that account? Is it an adequate account of the primacy or the very great importance of of morale of moral? Um, I would put that as number E in <laughs> our friend's uh, infinite list uh, uh, back there. In other words, the, the most obvious thing that Machiavelli challenges is not philosophy as such, although that may be true of it, but decency, that we can't afford it. But somebody who says that has given up a claim on us from without, which is a, perhaps a prime importance, an obvious thing. And I, I wonder whether, yeah, uh, uh, I've wondered for a long time, as you know, uh, whether whether your your account then doesn't accept something of the Machiavellian beginning point in the individual. Okay. Yes. Have a couple more. Uh, Andrew Badger, I'm a senior at the college, big fan of Professor Mansfield. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll just go back to the point about importance. I think it goes back to what we value as an important in society. If we value, you know making a lot of money as a corporate executive in Goldman Sachs and not motherhood or the sacrifice that a mother makes for children. And yes, what women do is always going to be seen as an unimportant. And we mentioned that more women go to college, the doors not closed. You know, Hillary Clinton almost became president, um, but there's still this discontent. They still feel like the doors closed and shut. And maybe it's because, you know, when your happiness is based upon the happiness of being a man, and that's never going to happen. So you're never going to be happy. Um, so I think it goes back to what we value in society as being important. Is you know being a mother important or being a corporate executive important? What do you value? Can you be both? Yes, but you know, what's, what's your point? I think we have time for maybe one more or two more. Yeah. I think it doesn't talk about somewhere at the end of the auction in America that is more just than our democracy, but less beautiful than it is. Justice is as greatness, it's elevation. Yeah, it's more theoretical than uh, practical, I would say, yes. And at the end, you see, I make a, I, I really step uh, or go quite a distance in, in the direction that you lay out. So, and so people say that, well, why don't we just have, go with a gender neutral society and let people sort, sort things out for themselves? And we, that's what we've done, essentially. And, um, and, they, and the, having women in professions has worked pretty well. I don't, I don't think there are any great uh, difficulties that have emerged. I've heard complaints from men about the feminization of the workplace, that kind of thing. But um, that, I'm not sure how much sympathy that deserves. So uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, so that, but, but uh, it, it doesn't work so well in the household. And there, um, well, women still do more than that, more than an equal share of uh, the housework, and my, most of them, I think, would be, um, um, you know, would, would, not, would not be happy with uh, the the result of an equal division of household labor. There was a nice episode on Desperate Housewives where the uh, uh, man and the woman exchanged uh, roles and. 
man did the work at home, and the woman did. You know, and then, so the woman came home, and she and her husband did um, her idea of his idea of he had a system naturally, <laughs> and uh, so what he did was uh, he cleaned uh, one room per day. So uh, therefore, the house was always dirty. <laughs> That's how I do it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so. And, and moreover, uh, I mean, I, 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 my wife is definitely not uh, satisfied with my notion, my standards of cleanliness. So, and, uh, so, and, and, but whereas uh, she might have to be if, uh, if, if the sovereignty were d- of, a, of a home were divided. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's because I'm afraid. Um, So uh, when I when I checked out manliness from from Widener, I noticed um, it was all scrawled all over. (laughs) (laughs) It was almost torn up. um, I'm sure by a WGS concentrator. That's what I'm going to study. And one of the comments in the margin was uh, the most scathing comment was something like "makes sense" coming from a Machiavelli scholar. (laughs) <laughs> and I want to upgrade my question tied to Machiavelli. Um, one thing you discussed earlier uh, is the difference between anima and anima. Uh, um, and I'm wondering if the, um, and this, this may be a non starter, but if the gender difference between the two words is deliberate, um, animo being defined as uh, spiritedness, almost in a way akin to thumos, but a lot, uh, and anima being tied to soul. Uh, do you think that the gender difference is deliberate? And uh, if so, I guess, you know, to elaborate on that. Oh, I don't know. That, um, that goes beyond my <laughs> philological skills, uh, for sure. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's... Um, when you're suggesting that um, the soul is something essentially feminine because it, because it has a grammatical gender, a feminine gender. Um, so, so that uh, I'm not sure that the genders and grammar uh, correspond to the ideas or forms of things. Animos, anima, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, but uh, uh, Machiavelli is above. I think is well above the. Uh, uh, gender difference and there's a kind of gender neutral society. I mean, he takes it for granted, I suppose, that things will remain as they have been, but uh, he gives this lovely uh, um, description of the Countess of Forley that was uh, dis- mentioned before. <clears throat> and uh, it doesn't seem that uh, he's really for in favor of manliness. Manliness is to be oblivious and to be to stick to what you uh, think and, um, and to, Stand, stand up for it, and be stubborn. Whereas uh, for Machiavelli, it's uh, it's never, uh, it's always a mistake to to uh, look upon some aspect or principle of your own as uh, as something you would die for that you that you wouldn't that doesn't have a trade-off. So he leads to the uh, sort of economic attitude of. Of trade-offs, and the trade-offs are not consistent with uh, manliness. So one, you could say, one general uh, um, <clears throat> force against manliness in modern times is uh, the, atten- uh, the, 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 uh, the attention we, we, we give to uh, to the economy and to economics, in which uh, um, w- women uh, count. Uh, equally or better living longer and not getting so angry but just remaining now and again bitter <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah um, I had to when um, I got the message saying I had to come with something to say I uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> this, uh, I, I, I uh, wrote a couple of, of paragraphs I want to read one of them because I, I I want to say, I, I really appreciate the book on manliness. Um, and um, this is what I wrote. Harvey's work, Manliness, is in part a much-needed de- defense of good sense. 
I don't claim to be able to give an account of the differences between men and women, but I know it is good sense to, to acknowledge there are some. We are, after all, embodied souls. Good sense may seem a feeble response to the nihilism that Nietzsche indicates we are facing. And Professor Mansell's response to Nietzsche does not directly address his account of the historical tr transformations of values that have led to modern post-liberalism, post-modernism, and whatever else is brewing in current life and thought. For Nietzsche, only a radical revision of human life in response to the historical debacle we find ourselves in, only an act of virile artistry would enable some of us cheerfully to dance over the abyss of moral and scientific prejudices revealed as empty and avoid the fate of last men. The feminist movement, for all its manliness, is not such an act of virile artistry, nor is manliness. Mansell ends the book with the moderate claim that women should be expected to be women and men should be expected to be manly. I call that claim moderate because I hear it as an insistence that nature, with all its ambiguities, is after all still visible to those who choose to see it. And that's what I appreciate. I think it more than anything else, the theoretical aspect of it, that there is such a thing as nature. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but I really want to try to keep looking to see it clearly. That's a nice statement on which to end. I'm trying to. <laughs> I was told you were going. I just wanted to add one small part, which is that um, so this is one of the things that Harvey has most often understood, uh, which is that I've known him for 17 years, and I must say that I think that he both likes and respects women uh, more than almost any man that I know, and he's rarely given enough credit for <laughs> Someone who's been his student maybe even longer than you, um, that he's been an extraordinarily supportive uh, teacher and mentor to women students and uh, over the years, and many of them are here today, and I think we're all deeply grateful for it. Clifford. Well, let's forgot. Let's <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Pretty good. Um, I have one logistical point to bring up, Susan. Yes, yeah, the uh, I have been uh, commanded, or maybe just authorized by Anna, to uh, make some to attempt some executive decision making regarding a possible photograph that might be taken. Now, there, it's very unusual for so many of Harvey's students to be here at the same place and time with Harvey. And, and so I know it's very painful, especially after a long day, to have to stand for a picture. But I would propose that Harvey and his students, I mean, that, see that row where Jim Stoner and Baum Faulkner are? If we could, uh, um, others might want other kinds of pictures, but I'm taking executive responsibility for this one. If, if, if we could line up there and maybe, is this too cute? And, in chronological order, uh, uh, Jim, you don't. <laughs> you don't want to buy entering yeah, class. You're tall, at least. <laughs> it's not hard. We. Alan Bloom tells it. You, you need a picture that can be interpreted, right? And so Alan Bloom tells the story of the picture on the front of Strauss's Platonic Political Philosophy, right? But did you, you know the story? Where uh, you notice it's blackened out, and you know who is the student who's in the back of that picture. Right. Mm -hmm. Professor Mansfield. And Bloom's line was, but then if you look closely, uh, there's a wad of money in Strauss's pocket. <laughs> and so he was uh, suspicious that Harvey slipped in. Um, <laughs> I don't know what that means. I think it just means let's, let's just. <laughs> <laughs> What's it mean? Not, not pre interpreted. Oh, story, yeah, yeah. Was Strauss's wife gave him money for the cleanup? <laughs> uh, do you have that camera, Anna, or did you give it to? Oh, uh, Susan has it. So, uh, yeah, it'd be a pity not to. I would like to have such a picture, and I assume others would too. <laughs>